Welcome to another episode of the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast with the co-founder of the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast. I am Naeem Lakani, co-hosting today with Anthony Yusefian. For this special episode number 300, we are turning the tables. Welcome, Kuhn. Thank you so much. It's really, it's really funny to be on the other side. So I'm looking forward to this, uh, to this episode and, and discussing what we've seen, what we've learned, looking forward and uh, unpacking uh, where we're going. So, so happy to have you both here and uh, let's, let's go. Awesome. Thanks for the opportunity. And I know we're looking forward to it and, and hopefully the, uh, the audience uh, gets a kick out of, out of some of these questions, but it'd be really interesting to hear just about how, how you got here. We often hear you ask guests how they got here, but the listeners don't always get that opportunity and maybe they've heard you on another podcast, but not on your own. So Kuhn, tell us about your journey to soil. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a funny question indeed that we, we always ask everyone, like, how do you spend your, so much of your awake time talking and thinking about soil? And, and usually nobody asks me that, at least not in, in this podcast. So mine, I mean, I was, I was born in the city center of Rotterdam, no connection to soil whatsoever. Didn't grow up on a farm, didn't grow up in a forest, um, always was interested in food. So maybe that was the, the beginning of a connection, uh, but never really connecting it. Uh, first of all, to soil and second of or let's say to the, the problem or the potential of, of, of food and agriculture. I for a long time thought if we just eat a bit better and, and source a bit better, we'll be fine if everybody would do that. Um, then maybe food was less of a, a damaging uh, piece. That was until I read an article or actually a chapter in a book uh, on solutions for climate change. I was very interested, um, this is about 13 years ago, um, to obviously climate change um, and I read about grazing, grazing, amp grazing, as we would call it now, regenerative grazing, holistically managed grazing, whatever term you want to use, but let's say different grazing. And uh, in Australia by Tony Lovell and Bruce Wade, they are both unfortunately no longer with us, uh, but were at the basis actually of SLM Partners, which we featured many times on the podcast. I read that article, I read the, the chapter and was blown away by soil carbon. Those two words I never saw in the same sentence. I was like, what, what's happening here? I saw some of the calculations, some of the cost pieces, because they did, were describing how these farmers that they were working with as consultants at the time were uh, way more profitable. And, and I did some calculations on the, the carbon potential. I was wondering why I never heard anybody talk about soil carbon at the time. And um, especially in the, the finance world or the entrepreneurial world, we were not focused at that at all. So that's where uh, the rabbit hole opened, let's say, and I started to fall in. And, you know, you were just reading this out of interest. Uh, you know, it wasn't part of your day job. Like, you know, what, what were you doing otherwise? And, and why were you starting to, to read about these things? Yeah, I was very interested in climate change. And I was working as a consultant in the energy space. And, and in general, just trying to keep up with, with, with reading. So I was actually reading significantly um, at the time. And stumbled upon this and reached out to Tony Lovell, uh, who was featured in that uh, in that chapter. He happened to pass by Amsterdam on a fundraising trip because the last sentence of the chapter uh, was something about um, we're starting a fund because Tony is an accountant or was an accountant and, and they were starting an investment fund to do this. And I was like, that's interesting. So there was soil, carbon and an investment fund in the same, let's say, chapter. I never saw that together. I was like, okay. And he passed through Amsterdam on a Sunday morning uh, through Schiphol, basically the airport, um, and uh, was on his way to Denmark to some pension funds to, to raise significant money, uh, which they did. And, um, and I was just curious to meet him, to hang out with people, uh, which is going to be a theme in this, in this podcast. Um, and, I just said, let's have a coffee because I don't understand why you, in your deck, because he shared a deck, uh, you don't mention soil carbon at all uh, as, a, as a potential. And he said the famous words, uh, because I want to be taken seriously by the financial world. And I was like, okay, so we have a, a bit of work to do, let's say. Why, why doesn't the, the financial work take this world, takes this seriously to begin with? And, and that was the beginning of the journey. So we met for a coffee in, on a Sunday morning where nothing is open close to Amsterdam Central, except for one place, which is still there. Um, and so he showed how to move the animals, how to how easy is that or not, what do you need in terms of infrastructure? And, and I was hooked basically on, on, yeah, management makes such a big difference. You don't need a whole lot of new technology. Of course, some stuff helps and we'll get there. Um, but it's, it's really a big mindset shift and an educational shift on land stewards. And from that moment on, I was, I was hooked on people, people like Tony. 
Yeah, that's cool. It's interesting, and, and we'll probably come up later. But the um, the way this community is and works, you know, at that time you're not a personality uh, in the space, and you know, just taking a meeting at at an airport to to explain more about about the scene, and I think that's a, a commonality that that we'll see, um, and and you've probably seen amongst your guests. Or maybe why don't you touch on that for a moment um, before we go back to kind of the origin story? You know, so many people you've met, have you found that everybody is this friendly and open and engaging to uh, having conversations? Yeah, it's been probably the biggest joy of, of this journey. Um, most of the people are, are on a mission, first of all, with a purpose. They don't have to do this in many cases. They could do easier things. It's usually sort of also the framing of our first question, like why on earth are you doing this? Of all the other career paths that could be easier. Um, I think recently I reframed it a bit, but it's that I'm curious, this is not an easy problem to work on. This is a marathon, which is gonna take decades probably beyond our lifetime. And yet I see so many people pouring their energy and their uh, successful entrepreneurs that really could be doing other things with their time and their money and investors as well. And they go all in and, and are, super open to share, of course, within limits of their agenda, etc. But actually next to the podcast, probably our biggest job is to connect people. And we always ask on both sides. So if you ask for an intro, I, I will also ask it to the other person. But nine out of 10 times, if somebody has time, they will make time to to connect. And that's what got me into this space. And I it wasn't only Tony doing that, like many other people are as John Kemp, a uh, friend of the show, likes to say, regeneration is about connection, reconnection of, of reconnecting between us, between us and animals, plants, uh, soil, and, and all of that. And, and it somehow seems that many people, of course, I'm not saying everyone, but they're quite open and nice people um, looking to connect to other people that want to do stuff in this space. Yeah, t- completely agree. Um, I think it's, a, it's kind of an inspiration flywheel from one person to the next, because uh, you just you get another intro and another intro, and everybody's super open and and uh, knowledgeable or seeking knowledge. And maybe that changes as well, uh, because we're still very early, and maybe this is in all early spaces. I don't know. I hope not, because it's it's been, um, yeah, with some small exceptions, like an absolute joy to to connect with most people. Yeah, fantastic. So, I mean, you, you say you're instantly hooked. So it, it wasn't it wasn't an itch that kind of grew. You just knew. I need to do something here now. So what happens next? You know, where do you go from the airport? Do you just get on a plane and start visiting Regen Farms or, you know, what, what's the next step? No, I mean, that would have been another option, but it's, I, I started tr- trying to, I started asking the question, what could I do in the space? At the time I started working at Aquaspark, a fund focused on sustainable aquaculture, um, and started slowly also working with Tonic, so a group of impact investors, all in, in those years, but let's say. So it wasn't that I immediately got on a farm tour or went woofing around the world or anything like that. Um, but I definitely started asking a lot of questions to people with resources and entrepreneurs, like, why are you not focusing on soil? And, and I never really got like satisfactory answers. Maybe people weren't too aware of the potential and the issues or the other way around. And so, I didn't really know what to do in the space. I knew I didn't want to set up a fund. I've seen that in Aquaspark, deep respect for Mike and Amy, what they've pulled off, but it's not my role uh, nor my my idea. I didn't want to start a farm. I think it was pretty clear and I'm still pretty clear about that. Um, No wish whatsoever to start farming, even though I love being on farms with friends. We love to be there with the family. We love the food. We love the people. I think farmers, uh, especially on the region edge, are the most interesting people around. Uh, But... I also see that's not our role. It's not my role. Don't let me in control of a farm. So I was wondering, I don't have the wealth to be a big investor. What can I do? I don't maybe don't have the entrepreneurial drive to set up a food company. Or So I, I was in those years working in different roles and different jobs and really trying to figure out what, what, is, um, what is my role in this space? Where can I add uh, most value? And that's basically how the podcast was born. Yeah. So, but, you know, b- before the podcast and, and getting there, so you, you, you worked, you were at Aquaspark and um, you then did Tonic. So, I mean, how would you define, I guess, in your do. own words, yeah. what, what, yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, you know, in your own words, what that role then was, you know, what is Kuhn's role is what? You mean now or? How, yeah, even it... then, and, and then maybe how it's evolved, uh, if it has evolved. Yeah, I think then, back then it was, um, annoying people about soil. So like sharing the few articles that were out there, the few documentaries, maybe some companies, some people started to 
look into that and and starting like grazing could be different and people look at you like what are you talking about and uh, nutrient density i don't think we use the term yet or i used it yet or i didn't know about it but at least quality is 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 partly influenced by soil health and and you just get this sort of glaze look on people like they're not really connecting to it or they're like oh yeah but also education is important or electric mobility and so i was wondering maybe i'm not the best storyteller in that sense or the best uh, convener of this these stories so maybe um, I should hang out with the people that are and that are building things that are potentially at some point investable and what's the role of money here? And, and that was sort of the, the genesis of the of the podcast. And I wanted to hang out with those people because I, I figured if I hang out with the Tonys of this world, if I hang out with, with others, maybe I figure out what my role is. And the, the, the start of the podcast was simply putting a microphone there because people, when, when you say, can I hang out with you? Can I brainstorm about what my role in this space would be? They're going to answer, I'm pretty busy, sorry. Uh, but if you say, can we record your story? Can I ask you all kinds of silly questions about the role of money? Um, because I'm curious about it. I don't know how grazing works. I'm born in the city center of Rotterdam, but I know you know. So maybe I can pull out that story and then have something that I can share later on with, with people, with investors, etc. And that's sort of how the question uh, started or the, the, the asker of questions started. And that turned out to be a podcast. Why a podcast? Because it's the simplest thing to do. You need a laptop and, and a microphone and an internet connection. And, and it wasn't even a thought to do video, etc. because it's just way too complex. So it was literally to hang out with people and spend an hour plus with people that are building things in the space. And they say, yes, when you say, can I interview you? Yeah. Nice. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, in the early, in the early episodes, uh, you did talk about, um, you know, I was talking to these cool people and I always thought, you know, I should record this. And um, so there, there must have been a moment where you said, okay, the next one is the one I'm going to record. Did you then choose your first guest or was it just the next conversation you were going to have? I mean, it was a bit of, uh, luck and and so i reached out to a few friends and whoever said yes first basically was first it was actually supposed to be tony lovell but we had huge internet issues um as we sometimes have in general but he was somewhere in the bush in, in australia buying a farm and and he just couldn't we just couldn't record and it was through skype still and we're i mean it was a very different different time so it became julian um and then paul mcmahon of slm and then tony i think that the third but that was simply because of timing issue or timing uh, and internet issues but it was that first bunch were all people close to us um, that just happened to um yeah happened to to say yes and then we found the time to schedule so there wasn't there was no grand plan and then Sally Calhoun was the first one that was that I didn't know personally and I got an intro through my colleague at Tonic and that was that was super nervous for that obviously so did you record several episodes before the first um, episode before kind of launching the first episode and were you really nervous about putting yourself out there? Yeah, it's a funny story. Um, so people that are listening are going to laugh now. Um, so some, some fans of the podcast, I won't mention them, now fans of the podcast, probably the biggest, um, they knew I was recording. So they're Tonic members as well. And this was, we started recording in September, October, I think. And around Christmas, I didn't put out anything yet because I wasn't really sure. I was, of course, like what, what like recording is one thing, putting it out is, is a second. And um, I was editing myself, so that takes forever. And, and it's not really the thing to do. It's, it's good to do because I did the first 40 myself because you hear your voices, you hear your questions, and it's very painful. Um, and then just before Christmas, they were going on holiday and they said, uh, this was still before you had Wi-Fi everywhere and, and cell reach everywhere. And they said, we want to download them so we can record, we can listen to them. So the 19th of December, if I get the date right, for sure I get corrected. Um, we uploaded them and that was when I think five, four or five episodes, there was when the podcast was, or three even, like that was when it was born. And that's also when we decided the order basically because it's when you upload completely random name in fact we had to come up with a name which we didn't have um completely random platform soundcloud that is meant for music not for podcasts and we found out later that it's better to, mer to move uh, but it was really a bit of pressure from some people that knew we were recording that of course i'm wondering why did i tell them um to to put it out there and it was nerve-wracking like of course you put like something that you sort of recorded on the side just for for fun and for and, and then you put it out there and then suddenly it's a thing and you've found you've gotten quite lucky with the name that you happen to choose as i heard from from one of your old amas why why is that um, and i assume you you wouldn't change it if even if you could 
No, I mean, in podcasting, there, um, I mean, now it's changing slightly with YouTube, but there are no real search engines or there were no, so there's no SOE search engine optimization tags work slightly, but you need to be found in, in either Spotify or Apple podcast for the most, I mean, some people use overcast, but for us, it's mostly those two. And so the name needs to say what it does. Otherwise you just never get found. So if you type in regenerative agriculture, you get us, um, and you get John Kempf, of course, now it's much more. Um, he has the regenerative agriculture podcast, of course, it makes sense in terms of farming side, but was pure luck. And for sure, I thought at that moment, it's way too long as a name, but <laughs> it's, it, it's, it, it really works well because a name has to say, say what it does. Otherwise you get lost. And the names change slightly, right? So it used to be just investing in, in regenerative agriculture. Yeah, we did. Yeah. I mean, at the beginning we were not only but predominantly talking i think land and, and land investments and and of course at some point the food part comes in so I, I deliberately we didn't change the name officially in a sense i don't think you can even do that um without messing up rss feeds and, and things like that or at least the rss name technology behind it stays the same but we definitely added food so and i also make a case of trying to say food before agriculture simply to emphasize the importance of it and and to just really drill to people that are going, oh, it's all about soy. And now it's also about growing good and enough food. And let's not forget what, what we're doing here. Um, so yeah, it's a, I don't remember when we did it, but it's a deliberate uh, addition of uh, the four letter word. No, I think it's brilliant. I mean, I'm always today trying to correct myself and I'm trying to correct others as well, referring to it's a food system. And it's a system with different stakeholders. So yeah. I think it's, it's it's an important change, and I, I'm really glad that you do that. And I like that you put food before as well, and that's brilliant. Um, so, I mean, just going back to the, the putting yourself out there, do you recall like looking at the metrics like religiously? Do you do we there just like looking at the downloads and the, of the, the views? <laughs> I would be. <laughs> Not that I remember. I mean, now we monitor things, and and it's way more crowded as well now as well. Actually, interestingly enough, at the beginning. I don't remember for sure I checked and, and for sure, but it was also a thing on the side. I was, I am still, um, working at tonic and at that time I was working way more at tonic. So this was also like, we didn't really have a release schedule. It wasn't that we were recording every week and things like that. So I, I don't remember hitting the, the refresh button religiously for sure. I did the first months and weeks and you get like the, the, the 10 listeners and 20 listeners and things like that, which is amazing because you still. You're recording too, and you have even 50 people listening to it is, is crazy. Um, but I think it took a while before we started structuring things and, and like releasing on a schedule and, and saying, okay, what are, um, and even still it's, we have discussions about it, me and, and my partner, like what, what is success look like? Is it 10,000 people listening 3000, or if you change the lives of a few, I mean, just had somebody on the podcast this morning that listened to a radio slot about trees and two minutes of that changed his life and went like he was 15 and he went into 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 trees and became a super successful forester set up organizations etc that two minutes or that radio piece changed his life forever like if you can do that even then only one person has to listen so it's it's also what are the metrics to look for i don't remember doing refresh re religiously but for sure we wanted people to listen to it because otherwise why would you why would you do it even though the goal was a bit just to hang out with interesting people for a while i never imagined that this would become a small media company and we could live uh, mostly off this of course there wasn't part of any there was no business plan after the first batch of the few episodes did you know you were going to do another batch um, or was it after some feedback that people were like, this is amazing, or I'm interested, can you please do more? You know, what, what made you do the second batch? And then when did that, I'm going from hanging out to people to maybe there's something here happen in your head? Yeah, that's a super good question. I don't think I ever thought it in batches as I just kept going and just, ah, oh, I want to interview that person. And I want to interview that person. Like it was just curious, following curiosity. That happened to be maybe in batches because we were in a place where it was easy to record. Um, but I don't think I ever thought, okay, let's do 10 and then let's see somehow, like, let's evaluate and let's see if this can, no, there were, if you look at our recording schedule now, our production plan, it's a list of 60 to 100, probably more of interviews I want to do soonish that are sort of like 
let's get them done as soon as possible. And then there are all the other people we need to reach, check in with again. And all. so the, the stories are endless, or it feels like there's the, the curiosity of, of digging deeper and deeper and check in with this person, et cetera. And that we already had at the beginning, like the amount of people I wanted to interview was way more than the time we had or the, the time I had to edit, et cetera. So there was never, I don't think it was even ever a question, um, let's do five and then let's stop or reevaluate and see where it goes. Then it was a very conscious decision to put up a website, which my partner did, um, to start releasing regularly, like let's do every month. Okay, let's start with that. Let's do every, instead of just releasing before Christmas because somebody asked, asked you. So it was a very conscious decision to, let's hire an editor, let's outsource that. Let's start to professionalize um, piece by piece. Um, but it was never a question I've, I've never, I mean, every time I hit record, I still think, what am I doing? Or every time, like the half an hour before, I'm thinking, like, this is not, like, what? because I'm getting nervous. And, but it's never a question like, okay, this is the last one, or this was only a few, because I, I noticed I also really, really enjoy the process of asking questions and play that tennis match at, at the, the, the fastest speed possible. Okay, which rabbit hole do we go in after? And and what, which hooks are there, et cetera. I, I, I didn't know, but I really enjoyed that process. 300 episodes. Um, I mean, it's a crazy milestone um, for, for creating content uh, at, at this level and, and with this many with this many interesting guests. Um, I was looking back at the release schedule, which you were just talking about, and your first 100 episodes took you four years. Uh, the next 100 was three years. And the last hundred, one year and five months. So that, that frequency is really changing. So there's, there's some life shifts in there as well, you know, in between, um, like you used to mention at the beginning of the episode, you know, I do this on the side, you know, that it's not like that anymore. Right. I mean, this is where the majority of your time goes. Tell us about that shift and how this became, you know, the main gig from the thing you did on the side. Yeah, absolutely. I think the moment we decided to release. And my partner came on board and started to say, okay, let's do a logo and let's do a website and let's do this on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, all of that we didn't have. Basically, it was me slowly building up a subscriber base uh, because you have to be subscribed to get notifications. And we have a high amount of people that listen to you or that get at least the notifications and things like that automatically and slowly building up a newsletter. And so the moment we decided, okay, let's do it regularly. And we thought, okay, what's the, what, what can we easily achieve? So we said, okay, once a month, that sounded nice. And then um, that triggered actually an interesting process to figure out, okay, what are we going to cover in 12 episodes? Like, what's the most important thing to, to do if we only have 12? Because again, we had 100 to do and only 12 to, to, to fill. So we, we set up a framework and, and that still guides us to a certain extent. We just, I just uploaded, uploaded it. Um, okay, what are the crucial pieces? What are the investment themes that we really want to cover? What are the, the potentially highest impact and most neglected uh, pieces of the industry? Nutrient qu quality and density, not surprisingly, landscape scale regeneration or global cooling, uh, transition finance, which triggered us to do a transition finance series and things like that. So there was really a moment, okay, this becomes a thing. Uh, we never asked for money until that. We got some donations here and there, but it wasn't a financial thing to be sure. Um, but from that moment, we said, okay, 12 episodes, we need some editing. Um, so we might need to also ask for money because then we can pay the editor and the website and things like that. So we set up a Patreon account and uh, basically started from there asking the money question, like, look, if this is important to you, we keep doing everything for free or keep it accessible. But if you have the means and we, we made a difference and we created value to you, please find a way to support us somehow. And, and people responded. And that's been, I think, an enormous shift in, um, in, in, in the company or in the, in the project. At that point, there was no company, of course. And so that really was a shift. And then we just kept, okay, twice a month. And then what do we do every week? Like, is that possibly physically? Do we have enough stories to tell? And can we do it time-wise? And that just kept growing with, with income growing as well. And uh, okay, now we do 75 episodes uh, a year or 70 to 75, which means every other week or every other week we double means uh, we, we do three episodes every two weeks. And yeah, that rhythm feels sustainable at the moment. I don't know if we reach the limit or if we are cannibalizing if we put out too much. The stories are there. There's no shortage. So that's that makes it. Um, yeah, we don't know if we've hit the limit yet or we should do other things. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, you mentioned other things. 
it, you've had great experiences, great conversations with different guests on the podcast, but it's also opened the door for you to, to other opportunities and other exploration about investing and, and the region space. You know, what, what kind of opportunities have you been exposed to and what are some of the ones that stick out that came as a result of, of having this podcast? Um, I mean, first of all, some amazing visits, hanging out with amazing people, um, because now we have an audience and not, not even because of the audience, I think because we, um, have the luxury to talk to many of the people I find most interesting and relevant in, in this space on our virtual couch. And, and they know other people, like it's all a small bubble still, as, as you know, as well. And so we, we get in, invited to places, we get to hang out with interesting people, and and interview them not always we also make uh, try to make as many introductions as possible um behind the scenes let's say or behind the podcast even if we don't feature someone because maybe they're not ready to 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 shout through the microphone um because in some cases that's not relevant but we try to make introductions for fundraising we of course know quite a few people with resources that want to put money to work and, and we try to be as conscious as possible about connecting them or asking for like would you like to be connected to the company behind this deck we always ask on both sides and and try to uh, to do that and i don't know if you were if that was the, the bridge to that question but we i also started asking the question probably three and a half years ago or so um when i knew companies were fundraising and i was interested in the company as what, what's the smallest ticket because i don't have a hundred K here and there to just uh, fly, fly around, let's say an investment. But if it's two K, 2000 or 5,000, maybe I would do it. And some of the companies said, yes, sure, come, come on board. And, uh, and so we, we got the chance. It opened the door to invest in a, in a few companies that we featured, uh, not because we invested, but I asked it after the interview, uh, simply because I, I want to be part of it, have some skin in the game. I want to invest, hence the word investing in this, uh, in this, uh, in the title of the podcast as well and have, have something more to say than just this, oh, this is amazing what they're doing. And, but yeah, no, I, I won't put any money in it uh, because that's, that's not my role. Now, actually, if I have the chance, then we should also, we should also do it. Yeah, great. It's, um, and I'm sure we're going to get more into that later. I did want to move a little bit from the history of the podcast to maybe some of the experiences. Um, you've talked to so many people. Um, early days, things were a little bit different in terms of, you know, how you interviewed and you've obviously honed the craft, but what are some, you know, any early anecdotes for, from early episodes? Um, and then, yeah, which ones are the most memorable, I guess, along the way? It's interesting. I mean, I've wondered if I should go back and I would say, listen to them all. Um, I always feel for people that reach out and say, I'm on a, like a listening spree and I started at episode one. I'm like, wow. <laughs> First of all, that's a lot. And second, I don't know if they're all the level, not, not because of the guests, but because of me that are super relevant. Like I can maybe make a selection, but it's also true that I don't remember, of course, there's more than it's 300 plus hours of, of content of, of very smart people sharing what they're doing and why and the challenges and, and things like that. So I, I usually what I remember are as anecdotes from, from interviews and ones that I just extremely enjoyed because of the flow of the conversation, because of the, the sort of tennis match that that happened and so um they stay with me and and sometimes i remember technical issues as well because i i'm always scared for connections that fail and and microphones that don't work um or if we do it in person i, I definitely remember i was in the offices of patagonia interviewing tinch adventures um i'm thinking blanking on the name but i had a small microphone with me and of course i was terrified it wasn't it wasn't recording it wasn't it was recording and then nothing happened or was not pointed right and, um so those those are more the behind the scenes or background noise somebody started drilling next door or a helicopter passing over because it's, we don't have a fancy studio um and also if we have one and the other person doesn't like it doesn't really help uh, i remember i think john kempf did our first conversation outside uh, of course, without video, um, but you heard a lot of birds, which he uh, apologized for. But for us, it was amazing because you have a lot of birds in, in the, and I think Tony Lovell, the first one was with a lot of dogs in the background or something like that, because he was on a farm. And so, yeah, that's, that's the, the case. If you don't fly people into your fancy studio somewhere, you're going to have some background noise. And, and sometimes it's just not amazing quality, but I think it's always been good enough. And um, yeah, we, we try really hard and, and also our editor to, of course, make it a sound it sound as good as possible as we can with not flying somewhere and recording it on the spot with a whole setup, etc., or having somebody fly to us. Um, but lately, I mean, 
it's a very long answer, but not very <laughs> structured answer. Lately, I've really enjoyed also the in-person ones we've been doing, um, walking the land on the farm itself, like walking with a farmer. Of course, you have background noise, but that's that's meant to be. Filming a few have been fascinating as well. So we've been experimenting. And of course, a new voice. We had Emma Chow doing a whole series on the regen mindset. Um, but it's been all relatively recent, like the last year and a half, I think we've been doing things things like that. So how have you, how have you seen regenerative food systems or regenerative agriculture change over the last several years? Um, and would you say you're getting more optimistic or less optimistic? Um, I would say more. Not because of the state we're in, because it's definitely, it's, it's, it's a fast downhill at the moment. Um, but from what I've seen change, it's first of all, it wasn't a topic like soil, except in soil science. And of course there were agroecology, there's been like, don't say region ag is a new thing, but there, it wasn't a topic, at least in the entrepreneurs I knew or the investors I knew. I remember at Tonic, like you mentioned regeneration or soil and, and people were like, yeah, sure. Why is that important? And, and now it's fundamentally shifted. So I think in some scenes, at least, it, the attention is there. Of course, there's a hype and, and that's good or bad. We can discuss about it. Um, but I think the attention is very different, which means we get entrepreneurs building things. And I think that's the big shift. I see very, at the beginning, we're there, but very talented people that have experienced elsewhere of getting, uh, excuse my French, shit done. Um, like building things, like raising money, building teams, like managing those things, which are the same everywhere. Like if you've done that very successfully in an NGO or in a movement or in a company and you applied it to soil, then I get very excited. Then I want to interview, follow, and hopefully introduce you to, to people because we need those people. We need way more people to worry about soil and, and people that are building things and, and lobbying as well, of course. But I, I think it starts with the cutting edge of farmers and entrepreneurs. And so I'm excited about that because I see an influx of people, um, of, of talented people that if they want to, please use the podcast to, to get up to speed or to, to get the frameworks you need, et cetera, and, and then hopefully come back when we can interview you. So I'm optimistic about that. Is it fast enough? Is it enough? Absolutely not, because yeah, you just have to look around into any weather overview, harvest, yield, um, conflict, water drought, fire, to see that we're in, in quite a mess. Yeah. And um, I mean, I certainly get a lot of inbound into myself that people are saying like, oh, how do I get into this space? And I, I think the people point is a really valid point. Um, I think I'm definitely been seeing it as well as the last several years, talented people coming into this space. Um, and I always direct them towards your podcast, by the way. <laughs> I don't always maybe say start at the beginning, episode one. I send thank them your you, way. Thank you. <laughs> but um, so given your exposure across that, you know, what you've seen uh, along the, the value chain of Regen, um, where's the biggest gaps at the moment that you kind of, that's is a gaping opportunity to talk about or uh, put more effort into? Where's the biggest gaps, do you feel? I'm hesitant. I leave a, I leave a gap there. <laughs> no, I pause because it's such a tricky question and I change my mind every time as well. I think we need a, I need a stack of things. We need way better education or more education for farmers. Like you cannot expect people to, to learn this. I mean, you can get excited, but not to learn this through YouTube, which is by default, almost the, the way to go for many. If you're in the middle of nowhere. And, and you're surrounded by people that are not interested in this. Of course, you're surrounded by people that are moving. Like if you have a neighbor that, that is putting virtual fencing, like the chance of you doing that is just way bigger. If you have a neighbor in a wild farm program or you have a neighbor like Roots So Deep that is, is doing like um, regenerative grazing, the documentary Roots So Deep, um, it's not guaranteed, but at least the chances are you, you're going to be exposed to it. And that's just not happening enough. And like structured education, most of farming education is super high input chemical, industrialized machinery. Not to say that all of those are, are irrelevant, but it's it's really not biology, let's say, and so photosynthesis. So we miss a basic training of a whole cohort of new farmers. So I would say that. I'm not saying that's investable, but it's definitely a gap. And then all the technology stack for, for farmers on from figuring out what to plant, where and why. We did a whole series on that and didn't really get super um, like investable or... or, or even companies starting to answer that question, okay, in this landscape, where where does it make sense to do what and why? Um, I think there's a lot to do there. The input side, we're going to make a whole series on that, actually. 
uh, on inputs, we're gonna um, like everything from compost teas to extract to biochar, always important and always difficult to do, but all needs to be done um, and monitoring. And so there's a whole piece there that I would love to to dive deeper into. And then the offtake side, like someone needs to take this off farm unless you sell everything on the farmer's market, but that's a very small minority um, and process it. Of course, not ultra, um, but get it to us on on, on our kitchen tables and, and things like that. So and, and needs to be paid well enough for farmers to to make changes. And and um, so I think there's a whole stack there. And then there's a monitoring for for verification and all of that. Uh, but there's a whole and we need lighter tractors and new machinery. So I, that answer is is difficult. I think we need a stacked approach. And that's why I'm also excited to invest in many of these because they're so different. And I don't think there's a golden solution that's going to change everything. Like biochar is going to change the world, probably with 30 other things that we don't know about yet. Yeah. Just, um, you know, building off that piece, a lot of, a lot of what you mentioned is, is bottom up, um, towards the consumer, but up to the consumer, where does the consumer come into this conversation? You know, how do they get, involved and educated do you think the consumer will ever move based on con conscious choices which we don't see that they generally do it's price and convenience and um, so what what is going to make them either pay a premium or make a different choice to to buy regen so that the off taker has someone to sell to yeah i think no I, let me say i hope and and um pray it's going to be health um, I don't know. I don't think we do know. I don't know. No, we people like we people uh, pay crazy amounts for superfoods and things we consider health, um, healthy. And I mean, the, the evidence is mounting that there is a connection between soil health and healthy produce. Um, but I've yet to see, except for a few exceptions, we, we know like a whole, like a cohort of companies that are capitalizing on that or are building things for food as medicine, healthy soil, healthy produce healthy gut systems and healthy people that that's why we made two two whole series on it and and we struggle to find companies to interview we had a few and and but like beyond the science is there very clearly now the question is like who's going to build on that so i think if we have the same conversation i don't know at episode 500 or in a couple of years then hopefully there are many companies on that and hopefully they have the the response. I mean, we see some of that now with wild farmed people saying, I'm, I'm always struggling with gluten, or I thought so, but actually it might be the glyphosate and actually the wild farm bread that just was released in, in the UK. Um, actually, I don't get that reaction. So maybe, but is it worth that premium? And is it people, are enough people, like enough people crazy enough about their health to buy food uh, differently and spend a bit more time convenient and maybe a bit more money? Um, that I really, really don't know. But considering we do spend a crazy amount on health, but not on food, that might be, I mean, it might be true. I see many people excited about it. I don't know. I haven't seen um, enough. I really hope so. I definitely do. Like us in our family definitely do. Uh, but of course, I, I can't like pretend that that's, uh, uh, that's the, the normal situation. And, and so... I, I hope that it's the key to unlock a lot of consumer demand or enough to, to keep this, to, to kick this engine into movement because you don't need everybody. You need 10, 15% to start really uh, demanding change and then you need the companies to supply it. So I think there's a huge role and, and I hope this ultra processed food moment with a lot of the, the health side of things with um, the, the, the weight loss drugs with companies, for, like maybe this is a moment. We'll look back in time and this is the moment that healthy food um, finally made a breakthrough because we know we've known this for a long time, but I don't know. Yeah, interesting. And I mean, you mentioned healthy food and, you know, obviously correlated to that is tasty food. Um, and, you know, these, these wild farmed and, and other regen brands actually just taste better. And there, there's an obvious relationship there between the, uh, the health components and, and the, the on-farm practice. Um, and it's interesting and an anecdote uh, to share, um, you know, from, from somebody uh, that, we, that we both know uh, who said, you know, to sell regen, we shouldn't be scaring people into, you know, if we don't do this, the world is going to end and climate is a huge problem and it's going to be terrible for your kids, but we should be encouraging people about the benefits. Um, and I think the example he used was BMW doesn't sell a car to you by telling you how crap it is to walk 
for 200 miles. What they tell you is how great the experience is and how it's going to feel to to use this product. And we need more of that in Regen. Um, and it, it seems like, you know, maybe that's a way to, to get to the consumer a bit more is to tell them about the benefits. Um, like, so like you mentioned, health and, and taste. And maybe that's more of an activation point than the doom and gloom that is, is sometimes commonly used in our space. And we've been a bit allergic maybe to that as well. Like, uh, like in the space, like the selling too much of it is always like, oh, can we do that? And can we claim that? And the marketing is not sexy. I mean, it is sexy when it's done well. Um, but to many in the space, maybe then it feels like an oversell or something. But we need to hit um like hit people and like and, and touch nerves which means you need to market and you need to get very smart marketing people and communication people on board that know how to um how to reach people and how to touch people and that's maybe not the same as the people uh, growing this food because we cannot expect farmers to be amazing marketeers and and maybe it's not the same people making the food but we need really good storytellers and that might be a bit itchy sometimes if you see some of the memes of Wild Farm, um, but it's reaching a lot of people and it's very effective and that's what we need. Like it's no, I don't think it's a shame to shout it from the rooftop. Like this is better for you, better for everyone, better flavor. And okay, if you have a problem with that, show me show me the opposite or show me how good your food is and probably it's not. Um, so it's that shouting, I think we're not used to it, but we need to, to embrace it. Yeah, totally. Um... You know, you, you mentioned earlier that you know, there's a, not a wait list, but a list of people that, that you're waiting to talk to in so many conversations. You know, is there, are, are there any, you know, um, some number of guests that you just, you're, you're really waiting to feature and you're like, I got to get this person on and I, I need people to hear their story. Um, and are they on the list? Um, or is, is it, uh, are there people not on the list that you would love to get in touch with and, and be able to get on the show? I mean, we were discussing a bit pre-episode. Uh, I would love to get King Charles, King Charles on the show. Um, for anybody who didn't see Farmer, The Farmer and His Prince, it's an old documentary you can find it on Vimeo streaming. And, and I think his view, I'm just very curious. I'm also very, I think he can't for many different reasons, um, but I'm very curious on, on the land use, on his vision of food and, and all of that. So that would be, I would love to have, have him on and, um, Apart from that, I think a bit more, a few more chefs. I think there's something there. I haven't really figured out the angle yet, but somehow that keeps coming up. Um, I mean, innovative farmers are always interesting, but there's there's no, sh not, not, I'm not saying there's no shortage. Um, and no, I'll probably leave it at that. I'm very, I think the, or some artists, like people, I start to see more people interested in uh, like, how do we get this to this message of the potential of soil and healthy food, et cetera, to wider audiences? And and I think art could be very, uh, is very effective in that. So we need way more people using very their very creative skills to communicate this outside of our little bubble that maybe listen to our podcast or, or to John Camp or something like that. But we need, how do we break out of this bubble? And, and that we need other mediums and, and art would be amazing. So I want to definitely explore the creative side uh, more and, and see because I think it's such an inspirational piece po so poorly told until now what soil can do or what regeneration can do it's such a, an interesting visual story that we haven't really um, really covered yet enough and I think when people do tell the story it, it, people are really interested in, in consuming it um, you know, I remember I don't know if the account is still there but on TikTok you know, Chinese farmers who were just filming their day on their phone um, and it had tons of viewers and people are just interested in, in what was happening. And we see things like that with Clark's farm. And so the, the media is growing, like you mentioned art and we, I, I feel like we're in, in, maybe it's just our echo chamber, but there's, there's more content. There are more movies, you know, things are hitting Netflix, people are consuming them, but I guess my question would be, and then what? So you know, it, it, we talk to people after and they say, Oh, this is fantastic. And it's amazing, but nothing changes tomorrow. Um, and is that just a, a time lag thing or are, you know, are we missing a step and what's the call to action after people get exposed to this media to then how do you get involved? Yeah, I think it depends a bit. I mean, as, as a citizen or consumer, I don't really like the word consumer, but as a, as a person that eats, which hopefully if you listen to this, you, you can do that when you want. Um, 
of course, there's a role there, but I don't think we have to cover cover that. I think as a as an entrepreneur, there are tons of businesses to be built here. So let's like let let's get you educated in the sense that get you exposed to all the things that need to be done, and then you you will find enough to to do. And I know many people that have made the switch from other sectors and and are extremely happy. And at the same time, it's an extremely complex food system, like Anthony likes to say. Um, so this is a marathon, but we need we need way more people building things. And then as an investor. Um, there are tons of ways to put money to work and you might have to dig a bit deeper. You might have to, to, to question a bit more, but there's definitely not a, an overload of cash, let's say, getting to work here in, in the space. And as a, if you work in a big food company or anything related to food, there's a, there's a huge amount of work to be done there as well. Internally, we have to work with the big food companies. I don't think we can escape that. Um, and there's, but there are massive changes to be done there. So I think the role is like it depends on your your background and your role currently but there is a role for for almost everyone and it's yeah it's it we're still with very few yeah fascinating um just a couple more questions on the on the podcast um you know so you've come this far you've learned a lot uh i listened to a couple of the older amas my older 20 and 2020 and i was surprised at how many you know nuggets you were dropping I was like, this, this guy's really <laughs> absorbed a lot um, he's not just asking questions you know what what uh, maybe key insights have you generated over i guess the the last 13 years broadly and otherwise over the last uh, say eight years or so with the podcast that could be a whole different episode no i'm like not yeah. that we learned but like i think I don't know. It's it's biology stupid. Like it's it's really the photosynthesis and the, the mechanisms are so basic and so interesting and we know so little. Like what makes a tree grow faster and, and how does grass interact with ruminants? And all of those questions are not really answered. And how does a tree trigger rain as we've done with a full series? And still we've like, how did that? Like, and, and so I think... There's a humbleness there needed. I think I'm, I'm very allergic to people that, that are like, this thing is going to change everything on every, every field and every this and that. And, and I think that's, that's not the mindset nor approach. And I see the people that interacting daily with land are extremely curious and extremely aware of that we know very little. Um, and, and we, and so it's, it's a very, um, I mean, those, the, the nuggets of a single solution to everything, I think is, is clear, very, I mean, the amount of companies that we've seen that try to build something without having a farmer or land steward involved is staggering as well. And the amount of money they raised in many cases, like this is so, we're so disconnected. Maybe that's said, we're so disconnected from our food. And I've known many people have said this before, I'm not going to uh, iterate on it, but the fact that we are, and the fact that we are in, in cities and offices deciding on resources and on funds and investments without really actually knowing um what what is happening on the ground is and we're disconnected from our food that we eat and we're disconnected from from each other that's that, it's it's not scary but it's a huge opportunity as well when i see people reconnecting to their food and reconnecting to like it opens up whole different realms but if you look at how the financial sector is organized or how many of the food companies are organized it's completely disconnected on how um if we can even say that nature wants to organize things or nature wants to and and like we've really been scratching the surface of what's possible biology wise in terms of um, um, growing things and growing biomass and food and fibers and oils on landscapes. And we've gotten used to very degraded, degraded people, degraded landscapes, degraded companies as well. Like we've got a, we got used to quite a, a low bar and, and sometimes we get a hint, like we can look around the corner, we get a hint of what's possible. And, and but then we sort of believe that it's not possible. Like that could get too good to be true. Like you cannot end grow and have biodiversity and eat. And and we've seen examples that it is, but somehow the narrative of the the the, the anti narrative of abundance is too strong. And so I think that's. But people are building it. People are doing this stuff. And and is it all investable? No. Is it all perfect? No. Is it. 10 times better, 100 times better than the status quo, yes. And so we better get behind it and see how far we can push it. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, and I, the the one maybe uh, amendment I would make to what you just said is it is all investable. Um, it's not all venture. 
um, or it's not all high return. And at the end of the day, we have to invest in the planet. And in that way, it's a, you know, is mandatorily investable um, because it like is for, for actually is. all of our return <laughs> Uh, period. And uh, there is no return if we, if we don't have the planet at the end of it. Um, but yeah, different vehicles, different formats, certainly. Um, and investing your time. So like what you do and what, what many others do to, to try and get there. Um, and hopefully what you continue to do with the podcast. So I don't know if you have any ideas on, you know, what is, what is the future of the, the podcast look like, you know, continue growing and Im- improving it. You've done different formats. You've had the, the AMA in the past, you know, the special series, you have the, the standard format interview. You know, where does it go from here? What does episode 400, 500, 5,000 look like? Quick answer, I don't know, um, but we're definitely exploring. I mean, we see um, the, um, the space is getting fuller. So it's not that we keep growing with the, with the, the standard between bracket podcast um, like like we did before, which is fine. Whereas like, what 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 does success look like if if the the key people in the space are listening? Great. Uh, do we reach a mass or, or, or um, like audience with thousands or tens of thousands of listeners or a million listeners? No, but it's pretty niche niche. So what what can we do beyond that? Can we do should we do things on TikTok, Instagram, etc.? Should we do shorter form um, more with with video, etc.? Um, I don't know if that's our role. Maybe not. Um, but we do think that the knowledge of how environmentally sound, profitable and healthy agriculture food could be, should be more widely known. We have access to a lot of these people. Doesn't mean that we have to be the, the conveyor of this message, but this message, these messages, because it's all consortium has to be promoted way more. And I think can give way more people hope and hopefully get them into action. So we're thinking what to do there. And, and definitely we want to continue you know, some of the series we've been doing, which is also, I mean, sported series. Um, are an important part of our business model. We, we can do this freely for everyone because we have monthly supporters. Thank you if you're one of them. And because we have uh, a number of foundations and family offices that support a specific series that they want to unpack further. And they don't have any editorial um, influence, but they do make it possible to, to make a lot of other episodes as well. And we have a video course that you can follow and, and pay for. And those three together keeps us keeps us alive and keeps us going, which is amazing. Um, and keeps us from having to take sponsor deals and and like, oh now get your superfood from this and this company or some some kind of things like that. We don't have to do that. If we do it, it would be something I actually eat myself and I feel really good about. Until now that didn't happen yet. Um, so we're in a unique position that we're pretty pretty independent and and we don't, I mean uh, we don't have to do, but it also gives a huge responsibility. Like what's next? How do we reach way more people? We have about two and a half to 3000 listeners per episode, which is amazing. But how do we get that to five or how do we reach more people in a different way, which equally is fine. And so how do we get more impact? How do we reach more people? How do we put more people into the space, get bitten by the bug? And, and that might be getting more artists involved. It might be uh, because what we have is is access to people. We have a, a, a great podcast or something I really enjoy doing. Um, but that's not, it's a means to an end. It's not like we have to keep doing that forever or we don't never have to change that. If we can reach more people differently, we might end up doing that and make more introductions, make more connections with people because most of my email ends up being connecting people to each other. And, and that is something yeah that that creates value one in a thousand changes a life so that's amazing um or one in ten thousand but once that happens it's a huge impact and if we can keep doing that and putting a spotlight on people um yeah we're not married to the format this is not an announcement that we're stopping um but i really 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 enjoy it but at the same time you know, we have to question and say okay how do we how do we reach more people and how do we touch more people and impact more people yeah, and, and of which you mentioned, you had so many, you know, two and a half to three thousand people. But think of the billions of micro lives you've uh, influenced <laughs> along the way as well. And the billions um, which, of euros. Yeah. yeah, yeah, billions and billions. Um, but yeah, no, that's uh, you know, rewinding from you know the future outlook and you know, coming back to to the present. Moment. So, if you have any ideas, get in touch, please. Sorry, there wasn't uh, was a, a question as well. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, yeah, definitely do. Um, but yeah, what, what I was saying is, you know, that's uh, forward looking. You're coming back to the moment. Um, you know, this is a significant milestone. Another hundred episodes. You're at three hundred. How, do, how does how does that feel? Um, you know, getting to the point like you're actually recording it. Do you ever stop um, and and think, wow, I've hit three hundred? And how does, how does how do you feel about that? 
Not enough, probably. I don't do that enough. I mean, I was thinking about it today, of course, because I knew we were recording number 300. So then it becomes a thing when you, you call it out. But it's it sounds cheeky, but every episode is, is, a, is a different one and just grow up. And if we have an amazing one, then I, I definitely celebrate or I think, wow, this is for me, this was one of super enjoyable it's, uh, because of this, this and this. But to stop and I, I see it when I start scrolling through the list. I'm like, oh, we interviewed them. And again, that, oh, yeah, and that one. And then you suddenly realize how um, how many people take the time to come here and, and how enjoyable 99.9 of the conversations are and, and how interesting the people are building. So I don't do it enough. I don't, so don't know how I would do it. Let's say, how, how do you, yeah. um, no, probably I think not listening to it myself, yeah. That's, but like how to celebrate. Uh, we did an event last year, which was, which was great around 250 because we missed the 200 more or less. And, and so there was great celebration. Many people sent in videos, which was amazing. Um, and, and so, yeah, together with people that are in the space, listening or not listening, but we've either helped some, some, somehow, I think that's usually that's the best way to celebrate because we, we try to make connections and then hopefully the rest does the work. Let's be very clear. Like we're not farming. We don't do that work. We're not investing. I mean, we're investing sort of, we'll get to that, but we're not running a big fund. We're not raising X. We're not inventing new technology. Like other people do the work and we try to put a spotlight on it and make that work go faster. So I'm, um, I always, um, bow for the people that actually do this hard work. And I see farmers do the hard work and it's hard work in the region space, non-region space, doesn't matter. This is, um, and, and or I'm not running a food company and trying to figure out sourcing and things like that. So let's be very clear. This is not the hard work we're doing. Yeah. Um, well, from, from our end, you know, congratulations on, on the 300. Um, but I, I totally get your point. 300 is an arbitrary. Every episode is a new personal best. Uh, you, you hit a new number and there's no reason we have to be so tied to the decimal system. If we were in another culture, 300 wouldn't mean anything to us. Um, but it is a 300th and we are in a decimal-ish culture. So there is, there is some celebration to be had. You know, is there, there's something you plan to, uh, to celebrate this milestone with your audience and do you have any, any special announcements for this, for this 300th episode? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we touched upon the investing piece uh, a few times and um, like what it got us um, in terms of access, in terms of people. And so for a number of years, we've been investing, like I said, two or 5K, 5,000. Um, and let's, let's not use all the, the, the specific investing language, but let's say two or 5,000 euros or dollars if we liked the company and if we could get access to it. And um now since two, 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 two years, um, we've been investing actually officially with a syndicate called Generation Re, um, which uh, Naeem pulled me into, um, convinced me that it would be a good idea to do, which I'm happy we did, but it's still uh, significant work, but it's been extremely fun to, uh, to start investing more seriously into the space without setting up a whole fund, which I talked about before is not uh, my role. I don't think it's our role to do, but because of the access we have and because of the the reach we have, we've never talked about it publicly. So this is definitely a first. That's why we wanted to, to announce it here, even though some of the listeners have been involved um, via via, we've done dozens of interesting things. So I'm, I'm very happy to unveil here. Generation Re, uh, we, we love the name and uh, also the process of, uh, of investing in regenerative food and agriculture, which is sort of the name of the podcast. So yeah, you've done now, I think the stats are, 18 deals in total over the last two, year, uh, two years uh, alongside, I think we're kind of counting it up now, 50 different other regen, ag, agriculture and food angel investors, which I think is pretty cool. And also deployed now well over 1 million US dollars and counting because obviously we have some live deals at the moment, uh, closing some deals. Uh, and in that time, also, I think you've got like one acquisition in there. We'll kind of get into that which is pretty impressive considering, um, you know, many VCs out there. Um, but look, tell me how did it all start? Give us that, uh, give, give us that story. I lo- always like this story. I think, Naeem, maybe you can probably frame this. How did it all start? You, I think you saw Kuhn on some cap tables uh, and then you're like, what, what is going on here? I think it's really nice to kind of start with that story before we kind of get into the portfolio itself. Yeah, sure. Um, I don't remember exactly which deal, and it, it was probably a couple. Um, but I, you know, I just started investing in the space and maybe doing diligence on on a couple different opportunities. And 
you know, I, I met Kuhn. I met Kuhn at, at Future Fest, and I think that's where we met. Um, got you know, we, yeah, yeah. You know, you know, got got acquainted, and um, you, you carried on, you know, being connected. But I'm I'm looking at some of these some of these opportunities, and I see Kuhn on the cap table, two K. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there, you know, you're new to the space and always asking the same question, you know, what's the minimum ticket? I'm not getting the same answer that Kuhn is getting. Um, not that, you know, you, we, we were putting in angel tickets, but it was just, I, I found it so interesting that, you know, his access and exposure um, and, you know, ability to communicate um, and network with, with these companies was just, you know, they wanted him to be participating um, and, and he wanted to participate. So I thought, you know, we have to have a conversation about this. There's, there's an opportunity here. And, you know, I think also coming from the impact space a little bit, um, you know, we talk about democratization a lot across many different axes. Um, but one of those importantly being investing and that shouldn't be only open to people who can write fund size tickets. How does that change? Um, and it seemed immediately like there was some alignment between these ideas. So, you know, I rang Kuhn up in whatever form of technology um, we might have used and was just like, you know, I think we can do more, more with this. You're, you're getting a line on the cap table. How do we, you know, open this up? Um, let's, let's try it out. Um, and, and I'll help you with it. It'll be easy. Don't worry. And I'm not sure Kuhn has a, the, the same feeling about that that uh, particular uh, detail, but um, yeah, is that how you remember it, Kuhn? Is more or less? Yeah, I mean, we were we were in touch since Future Food Ways. I think with the predecessor or the name of, of TSD before, definitely at Catapult. I remember like behind the stage there was like a, a table or something. We met and we stayed in touch, and um, like you do, you have a, a call every now and then, discuss some deal flow, things we, you were looking at, or what do you think of this? What do you think of that? Which which a number of people do, and I'm always happy to share. Of course, it's different if you have an investment in that. And then you found uh, us um, on, on the cap table somewhere, and then it was like, let's do a syndicate. And we're like, what do you mean? Um, let's let's give other people access as well. Let's bring a bit more money, because it's more meaningful if you bring 25 or 50K than if you bring two. Um, and, and of course it depends on the deal. It's still meaningful or not super meaningful, but it's also interesting to give other people access. So we started discovering, um, like what's the minimum, what are our legal fees and, and all of the magical world, uh, which definitely is more work than, than I anticipated chasing people for payments and signatures and things like that, but it's been working and we've done like more than a million we deployed, which I'm super thankful for the support of, of everyone. Everyone is investing individually, um, but we have some amazing people in, in the group, which has been really, really fun to see discussions around deals as well. And, and to see people interested in things or not interested or knowing companies, bringing companies to the syndicate as well. Like we're getting access to other things that uh, without the group we would not have. And I think it's the closest thing to community. We've done, of course, the Ask Me Anything webinars, the AMA ones you were mentioning. And, and this sort of feels like a natural extension, like, okay, if we pull our money together, if you have, of course, uh, resources and, and minimum ticket 1K, um, let's see where we get to and let's get exposure and let's get into some things. Because most of this, for including me, are completely impossible to get access to, like minimum tickets, 100,000 or 250,000. And like, that's for most of this planet, obviously. And so how do we get exposure to early stage deals in the regeneration space that is so early on? And, and hopefully some nice exits, or at least we, we participate in some very interesting things. Not all of it is venture, not all of it's going to do whatever K we need for returning a fund, but because we don't have a fund, we don't need that. Um, but many of these are going to be interesting companies. I'm pretty, pretty sure about it. Long term, of course, this is not an early stage or an early uh, fast thing at all, um, but it has definitely made it real sort of the investing piece and investing in region ag and food like the podcast became real or more real when we started actually investing yeah so have you on that point of actually investing um do you see any kind of change in your the way you view things when you put your money down was that um when you're when you because obviously you were investing actually before even generation ray i think several deals before that what is um did it help you doing this has it have you seen your the way that you've learned or understood the space differently now you put your own money down yeah i definitely 
did and do. I think we were investing before. I mean, we did Steward and, and Fence, which was an, uh, an interesting acquisition and um, Future Forest Company. And it's still sort of the approach is the same. Like I really like a company. Um, I like the founders, of course, That's the uh, and, and I just want to be part of it and part of the ride and part of the, the roller coaster ride in many cases, because none of this is easy. Um, of course, with the help of, of Naeem and also you, Anthony and, and Patch, the, the process has become much uh, more structured and there are more questions to ask and, and think because we're, we're putting it in front of a group of people. Um, and I think at the beginning, now we see it more like the brand side is interesting that is developing. We were talking about the offtake agreements, what is needed offside and we see actually people developing brands we've mentioned wild farm which is an invest uh, investment company or a portfolio company of ours and and uh juntos and others as well like we see people with marketing backgrounds and and sales backgrounds starting to to do things i don't think that was there two three years ago when when i started to put down the first check so that's different and just the whole set there's there's enough deals to do one every month and maybe more like it sort of feels like the podcast at the beginning like are there enough yeah. stories are oh, there are actually quite a few oh there are way more okay how do we structure this into a way that we can do more and and actually now thinking about it that might be a similar process we're going through now yeah i think you mentioned at the start you were three podcasts a month um I think very, very quickly, we could be at the same sort of thing, same sort of pace here at Generation Re, the pace that this has been kind of going at. I think that's one thing as well, like the deals. How do you, for the listeners, how do you source the deals? What happens, that process? Uh, and then how's the how's the filtering done and what do you take to the community? Because in the end, you are always yourself putting 2K yourself and going out to the community and like, I'm going to back this company. Who's in, right? Yeah, and it's really, I mean... We don't lead any deals, let's be very clear. We don't set pricing. We we don't have the structure nor the interest, honestly, to, to do that because then you set up a fund at some point or a huge syndicate. Um, we, we see interesting deals. It comes from either one of us or it comes from audience as well, like people in the syndicate that say, look, have you seen a deck of this? Or they're developed here, they're developed there. And we've seen sort of two main uh, pieces where we we get involved are two main categories of companies very early on, like super early stage where our 50 or now sometimes 70K tickets really make a difference or later stage where we get access to something that, that otherwise you wouldn't get access to um, because of the syndicate and because of the podcast, etc. So those two are very different types of deals, of course, because in some cases it could be millions invested and, and we're a small part of that. In other cases, the other ones are maybe a round of 200 or 250K and we're 50K of that. So we're quite significant. I mean, the process is a few calls with the founders, dive, a deep dive in the data room, writing up a memo, sharing it with the community and see if people are, are interested because of course it's a community thing. I would still do it personally if I could, but it's way nicer if people join and it's very interesting to see some people back everything. Some people are very picky, rightfully so. Like they, they connect with what they're interested in or ge geography or place in the value chain. And so then we get a nice group of people together and, and hopefully hit our minimums and then it's then it's a go. Yeah, so let's talk about some of those some of those deals. Because I think, yeah, you made a good point. The, the, the along the value chain, there's so much variety here in this portfolio already, effectively. Um, but one thing that is definitely standing out, and maybe it is relation to um, you know, feedback loops where you've had an acquisition, as you mentioned, in Fence, that was in the ruminant space. It definitely seems to be, I would say, a lot of ruminant plays here. And is this, again, we asked you the question, what have you learned from this podcast? Are, are ruminants quite something that you've learned about a lot? <laughs> Tell us more about some of the the ruminant plays that we've, uh, some of the deals. Yeah, I think it's a constant feature on the podcast, the role of animals. Is there a role of animals? And I think we've established, yes, what kind of animals, ruminants versus non. And and there are a lot of issues around it. I think it's the the a big key into the future of agriculture if we get this right. Uh, probably both grain in terms of just sheer hectares and acreage and ruminants. And they're often connected because it often gets into feed of the other one. Like we need to fundamentally change that system. So I'm very interested in people that are doing it and, and not so interested in people that are, are arguing for the precision fermentation and the technology or the lab, or the factory grown pieces. Um, not that I don't think it's going to play a role, but I think like, how do we 
um, with some limited technology or new, we don't have to invent a lot of new things to, to change the role of ruminants fundamentally from what we have now, which is a very high input, very high emissions system to uh, actually regenerating landscapes. So I'm very interested in technology in that space. I'm very interested in companies like we did uh, we featured them well as well here, Collie, Virtual Fencing. I mean, Fence was the first virtual fencing company, or one of the first, and then also got acquired. We did that before the syndicate, uh, but we've invested in Collie, in No Fence. Um, so definitely on the, the virtual fencing side, Rumi as well in the UK. Um, so we're, we're definitely heavy on the, on the ruminant side of things because I think the, the change potential is, and the opportunity is so large like in terms of reducing emissions and in terms of potentially storing and in terms of sheer acreage. Um, yeah, it's just more relevant. It seems like, I'm not saying you should work on that, but in terms of hectares per, for vegetables, it's just way smaller. And so the, the lever is just much smaller. And and I have to say the the founders in this space are just also fascinating people. They're all fascinating, but the ruminant space seems to be attracting some very interesting people as well. Yeah, I think it's interesting the fact that like, it's obviously appearing in the portfolio. I think, as you said, there's actually quite a lot of competition appearing, innovation there. Like there's several fencing companies, for example. It shows there's an opportunity here. I think there's always a good signal in the market. Um, you know, I think we echo the same sort of feeling at TFT as well. Um, but yeah, I think uh, the, the ruminant stack is, it can't be ignored. It is a 1.7 trillion industry. You know, I think some people forget that. It's like you can't just remove the cow as well as, as the kind of data um but in that you mentioned it as well earlier on is brands i think it's quite interesting um or the off takers i think i think we're starting to see more come into us and deal flow then i think we're building more conviction that we've got to put some support here um the community wants to support more emerging brands um should we talk about some of those ones you've done i mean we obviously you mentioned wild farms we can talk about that uh, i think Huntos is a is a very interesting one. We should talk about that. I, I was really interested in, in that in that deal and how well that went. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, both of those deals. Um, I think Naeem coined the term uh, or heard it somewhere as well. But the, the megaphones in the space, like people that are able to to reach a lot more people outside our echo chamber, meaning customers, consumers, people that are actually buying this stuff. And, or people that just visit a random restaurant and get inspired and things like that. And so Wild Farmed is um, now even more known, I think, with, with Amazon Prime going live these days when we're recording this with Clarkson's Farm. Um, if you live in the UK, you can find it in, in supermarkets. So really trying to reinvent the grain value chain. And, and is it perfect? No. Is it a massive step beyond everything we've seen? Yes. And is it reaching a lot of people and a lot of farmers? Yes. And so it's really... Uh, interesting to be part of that and and just to to see what they've reached in two three years or plus of course 10 years of indicator farming in, in southern france and discovering all the difficulties that, that comes with that and and juntos in a similar um place actually in, in ibiza really using a restaurant as a and, and farms there they have to operate two farms um, really using that as a as a showcase of what's possible with food and uh, using that then to to get into the essential oil business and sourcing that from mainland Spain. We've we've had Christian, the founder, on on the podcast as well. So really trying to go beyond. Okay, we need to regenerate this is amazing piece of paradise called Ibiza, uh, where of course money is flowing around and a lot of issues are with farming, but it's tiny. But how do we influence the millions of hectares in in the Iberian Peninsula that are starting to to become a desert? And how do you back? Yannick and Alfonso, two farmers there that we also had on here to start sourcing from them, paying them well and, and make sure many hectares are touched. So we like to, it's a complex business. If you look at it from a VC or a very narrow fund perspective, probably you would look at Juntus think, okay, there's too many moving parts, uh, but we see it as if it works, you need all the moving parts together. Otherwise complex systems don't work. And that's a, probably also a clash with, with if we would do a fund or some kind of structure like that, you need to be very narrow and, and, in this case, like with the podcast, we can just follow our interest. And of course, it needs to be a good business and good business plan and, and experienced team, etc. Uh, but it doesn't have to be in a specific only category. We only do inputs or we only do composting machines or something like that. That would just not fly because our interest takes us to the full stack of things we need. Because again, there are no silver bullets that fix everything in the food system overnight, unfortunately. And I think many investors have learned that the hard way in, in some of the boom and busts we've seen in, in the last last couple of years yeah the um 
the off, I think I've learned so much, even as, as an investor myself, as, as, as a part of the uh, the community as well. Uh, just from it's built my it's built my confidence that the, these brands are going to be so important in kind of driving driving the change. And also the, underneath that is these brands are also showing the infrastructure for them to to uh, to scale is not there from the data to the to the actual hard infrastructure. And we've done a deal with Ken Springs. We supported that one. Um, which is uh, essentially a regenerative mill, right? Um, Milling infrastructure. Who would have ever thought that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but then another one which really surprised me was because um, it was so early. Uh, but again, it's very there's some similarities here in infrastructure and brand and offtake. Was Sukufsmo, the the topic of polluter culture. Um, tell, tell 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 the listeners about that one. Uh, it really surprised me. I mean, it's it's a bit of an outlier, not because it was so early, maybe, but because I mean, peatland rewetting is is not a thing we we cover all the time on uh, on the podcast. We will we've got this company on for sure. Um, but we met Julie and the team through Ecosia actually, who was super enthusiastic and and also is investing. And so that that also shows like we're not discovering these as as the first and then go in and decide that this is amazing. No, we try to follow people that um, are are putting first of all more money in and and also more time. So we definitely are followers, usually the last money in. But we got excited. Peatland rewetting. If you don't know, look up the drawdown articles, project drawdown. Like it's a massive carbon um, uh, risk at the moment, and and most of the peatlands have not been rewetted yet and have lost a lot of carbon. And it's a massive opportunity. And there are not really many business models apart from um, some around uh, water buffaloes and things like that. And we have to re-wet if we want to hit any of the carbon um, targets we have. And so they've come up with, with a model. It's super early. We asked the community because we were discussing it internally, like this might sense a bit too early. They're pre-revenue. They're buying their first farm on their first uh, peatland. And they, uh, yeah, we have to still see if carbon credits are going to come out of this. Machinery is tricky. Seeds is not so easy because not many people are doing this. Uh, but we asked, uh, we have a WhatsApp group on potential deals and we asked it and it was a very live discussion. Um, like uh, people were, and the, but the majority was, was, yeah, that's why we're doing this. And a few people didn't, which is absolutely fine. This is on a deal by deal basis. You don't have to do anything. But there was enough enthusiasm to put it in front of our, our larger group and say, okay, are we, are we doing this? And uh, and uh, the response was strong, and so we we invested uh, together with some other people into rewetting of peatlands. Which, if you asked me a year ago, I would probably say like, "What?" Just uh, uh, echoing that, you know, it, it is uh, it's super interesting to see the community come together, um, and the conversation that's generated, and just uh, the you know the angles of not only interest but knowledge that that come to be you know deployed and discussed and hearing people talk uh, about this stuff and their exposure you know tendentially to maybe something like um, any of the deals and it's it's just so insightful and i think from from our perspective as a as a venture investor where you know like you mentioned you know we want to be precise and principled about a thesis we need to know when to say no and where we can add specific value to make um, you know to make bigger bets it's been incredibly interesting and, and rewarding to be exposed to more of the value chain where we can see, um, you know, where the digital infrastructure is needed and, and where we can provide support. Um, and it's, it's just also really helps to bring together um, the understanding of how complex the system is. There's so many stakeholders playing in so many different parts of this. Um, and if it's, if we're really talking about systems change, then we need exposure to all of it. Um, we need to see and understand and learn from it. Um, and I think you, you'd say this often, like there's no better way to learn. Um, and, you know, have, you've, you've seen that on your journey. And I think, you know, are you seeing that from, from uh, the people who are participating with us as well in Generation Re? Uh, absolutely. I think I see people, I mean, there's no better way to learn if you, to, than doing this. And if you're not going to build a company yet, or, or maybe you don't, there's no, I think, better way to do than investing a bit here and there. Of course, only with money that you don't need um, right now or in the next 10 years. This is risky stuff. We're very early in many cases, uh, but it's really, really relevant to be because this is, goes way beyond the egg funder updates or, or things like that. Like you see real companies from the inside and real struggles and real opportunities and real insight from founders that uh, are, as we know, in many cases are super happy to come on webinars after to answer any questions like this is 
the the crew we have on the podcast regularly that are really open to share of course they're open to share a bit more if they're talking to an investor in their actual company and so i think the act of investing and the act of putting money to work and the act of having skin in the game whatever is is meaningful to you um of course we have people with different size wallets let's say in the space but the act of doing that um, is very different than just talking about it. Of course, the act of buying a wild farm bread in the, the supermarket is great as well and sharing Clarkson's episodes and all of that. But to be actually exposed to it and to be able to lose the money because that's going to happen in some of these cases is a very different feeling. I noticed it with me. It's a very different. That's why I asked the question the first time. I don't remember if it was Stuart or um, Jim of the Future Force company and now became Undo or demerged and, and split. But like, what's the minimum ticket? Like, that's quite a commitment to make. And then you have to wire the money and it's not always easy. You have to find different platforms. And But actually you, you wire a significant amount of money. 2000 euros to me is a lot of money. And and so then it's gone for a while and maybe gone forever. So it's it's a very different emotional thing, but you learn a lot from, I read the, the investor updates very differently uh, when I'm an investor or not, because yeah, your your money is on the line. And obviously, yeah, you mentioned that uh, there's other, we've actually, there's other deals we've done in here. We've actually invested in operators actually as well. Um, actual farm operators from the Foundation Farm, Tree Range Farms, Agroforestry Raised Chickens. I absolutely love that one. Um, uh, I'm excited for more uh, in, in that space, certainly. But where, is there, a, is there a deal you really want to do in a category you kind of meant, I think you're alluding to it earlier, like inputs or something like that. Um, but actually we haven't really, other than undo, it's probably the only uh, input company I think we've actually done. Is there something that you, you're you thinking about? We'd love to see an innovation in that space or a shout out to the listeners if you've got something exciting brewing in this space. We'd love to hear. I mean, I get a lot of deals on the input side and that's why we're doing a series with, because I don't know enough about the space. I don't feel confident to, and they all look amazing. We've seen the decks as well together. Like they look amazing. They seem to be the silver bullet for everything and everything The the side by side photos look amazing. And, and I did, but I just don't know enough about it. That's why we're going to do a series with, with John Kempf specifically unpacking that, like what are the mental frameworks and investing frameworks you need? Um, if you don't have to become a, a biology guru to understand inputs, because I do think they're fundamental for the transition, but parking that aside, so I, I'm going to wait until that series is done so that I have a better a better framework of saying yes and no. I think what I would love to see is is the nutrient density and quality piece and food as medicine, like who are com- what are companies on the measurement side, but also companies, because we don't need to do only technology, like that companies that bring this to people that really need it, like where can we have the biggest impact in the, this ultra processed food, junk food addiction we're in, uh, it might be elderly, might be children, might be people trying to, to, to get pregnant, might be whatever, but who is going to build companies around it and how can we invest in that? I think that that's just very, very interesting to me is it's going to be impact bonds, outcome based, like what kind of innovation are we going to see there? Not only for the people that go to the farmer's market and already get exposed to this food, but how to get it to people that really need it. Is that even investable? Is that a government thing? Like, But we need way more food as medicine companies. Yeah, definitely. I think we talked about it. I'll make a, a point now. Um, children's food is what I would like to see. Some sort of food as healthcare, children's food. Where's the regenerative children's food? Uh, obviously, as a, as a father of two, uh, and maybe I, I've changed my opinion on, 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 on this kind of stuff in the new, recent years, but it's, it's actually quite shocking that I actually can't find these kind of brands that exist, but it feels like a gaping opportunity. So hopefully that's an inspiration for many to kind of <laughs> look at that. But anyway, back to the community. What I love about our, the community side, I mean, um, what surprised you most about the community um, so far? And it's only been going two years, but... And uh, for me, there's been a few kind of uh, jump outs, but for you, um, what, what surprised you most? I mean, we have some people in the community and if you're listening, you know, who you are, that's simply been backing all deals or most deals, which is amazing. And, and basically see it as a learning experience, like a cheap MBA and, and some places put significant money, some other, and just simply um wanting to learn wanting to get exposure maybe skipping one or two but really just being there without asking a lot of questions not asking for a lot of time 
And and that's really been fascinating to to see that. And we sort of have a core group there, uh, which is great. And and they really make it possible that others can join and not join based on on uh, personal space and financial space, etc. And and it's been growing. That I find as well. Like you always think, oh, are we going to find enough deal flow, or oh, are we going to find enough people? Like maybe at some point it's just done and it's just been growing over time and over time. We just broke another record in terms of uh, of investing investing and uh, for hours like in terms of deal size what we put to work and so yeah the 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 list has been growing in terms of people and and also the amount we put to work and the amount of deal flow um so that's been extremely and the conversations as well with people like it, it gets to a different level when it's about money and the, oh, the podcast is nice or uh, yeah of course um but then okay so you really like this company i love this episode about this and this and it. okay did you put money to work and like oh no yeah i should have done that and 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 like it, it really gets different if you know that they they were on the list and they had exposure to it and they didn't do it and then they still love the company um it's interesting because then it's like okay what made you um not put in one or 2k just to be part of it and they're like yeah yeah so it's it's a different emotion there which i completely understand i'm not blaming anybody here but it's interesting uh like can you, as, as the investor group in the Netherlands is called, put your money where your mouth is? Like, if you can, why don't you? And, and I would love to know why, because I'm, I'm curious about that. Yeah, I think uh, totally, totally agree. And I, another one of the things that stood out for me was some of the community now recently has been obviously bringing us deals, as we talked about before, but also like wanting to kind of help with the due diligence process, or the writing up of the notes, and you know, it's not a. It's not that you know, it's not a simple. And not earning anything on that simply because simply yeah. because they want to be part of it. They wanted us to do the deal, so they could invest in it, and they could have done it otherwise. And so they helped. Uh, shout out to Alexis, helped with with due diligence, writing a memo, and making this happen. And so yeah, that's been that's been fascinating. Yeah, definitely. So if we want to encourage that even more, um, and in the end, this is a community. I think uh, that's the that's the echo of the pointers. Uh, we're always open to ideas and how to kind of further this and make this better. So, what is what is ahead for January or generationary, however we call it, Naeem uh, or Kuhn? Uh, what is it? What are we? What's what should we? If people are interested, how do they get involved as well? That'd be kind of good. I, I can do a short, short response and then I, I'll pass it to you, Kuhn. But. Um... You know, like you mentioned, just get. I think growing the community. It's like like you just asked, and and Kuhn just answered. It's been such a valuable part of the process. Um, it's about democratizing access and bringing more people into into the mix. So I think um, I think we have an opportunity here to do that. And you know, similar to the question I asked you earlier, like what needs to happen in the space, and just more more activity, right? We're we're trying to bring more capital into space, get more, more conversation. Life. More exactly, we're regenerating uh, investment in regenerative agriculture investment. Um, you know, it's uh, it's been interesting, and I, I think that would be the most rewarding to seeing more more people show up. And every conversation is interesting, and you know, you you've seen this over three hundred episodes and many more conversations. Many people arrive at this space from a different angle, and the number of backgrounds that you hear that just have nothing to do with ag or food. And they said, now this is my passion and this is where I'm spending my time is, is super interesting. So I think providing a bit of a platform for, for those people to get exposure and learn, dip their toe in and see if they want to spend more time. And I think we're building, this is just one part of an ecosystem of opportunity where, you know, your course is, is an interesting um, way for people to get in and learn about the space. And then, you know, even the podcast for me was, was another way that I, you know, I'd got to ramp up my education very quickly. Um, and hopefully this can be another way for people to then practically get involved, um, and say, okay, I am going to, you know, get some skin in the game and see what that feels like. And if I want to do that more. So I think, you know, growing the community, I would say from a kind of abstract perspective is, is what's ahead. I think that will be super interesting. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, you can, then throw in your two cents there and also how do people get involved definitely get involved if you want to um of course this is for uh, sophisticated investors only we use a platform in the uk called odin uh, and they do the screening for that um, but you can sign up you can get information on the deals we have open and more information on terms and all of that and also the portfolio we've done until now because we didn't have a time to of course cover all of them here on gen dash re dot land and of course find the link in the show notes below so it's gen dash re dot land and uh, very simple sign up form get 
get on the list if you want to. And we have a WhatsApp group as well, where we discuss a lot of deals, insights, things, and, and other random random things around investing in, in regenerative food and agriculture. So I think to round us up, I think everyone, there's the question probably everyone's been waiting to hear, which Kuhn asks all his guests. Obviously, this is not investment advice. <laughs> <laughs> you always get that in there. I always enjoy that bit. But what would you do, Kuhn, if you had 1 billion euros, dollars, pounds, whatever is the best powerful currency at that point in time? What would you spend that 1 billion on? Now, you've had Probably 300 episodes to, to think about this. This better be good. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to quote one of our interviewees. I think it's still the best answer. Um, I would probably put a bit aside actually for some lobbying. Um, simply because it seems such a high reward if it works uh, for such a low investment. I think we need a, a much stronger lobby in Brussels and Washington to begin with, and London probably as well, uh, in terms of let's let's um, move away this um, the subsidy schemes and all the hidden streams of money from from the extractive system. Um, but that would be yeah a, a small amount of the one billion. The rest, a significant amount, would go to, I think to how to put it to work. I don't know exactly, but indigenous tribes. Like, how do we safeguard the last bit of biodiversity we have left? I know it's a cliche answer, but not enough money goes in, in that direction at all. And then the rest, um, let's say what we have left, maybe half of it is left. Um, we had a, a guest, Gustav, on the show that said, how do you tap into the wisdom of the crowd? How do you tap, not the, the general crowd, but actually the informed crowd. Let's say people that have listened to this podcast many times, um, that somehow you would have a way to measure that. I don't know how, of course he was on the blockchain uh, train. So you would know people that have, have spent time listening to a significant portion of the episodes and guests, like we have 300 guests until now, some repeat, so let's say 250. Um, and then somehow figure out a way, like how would they put their money to work? And it could be a small amount, could be through the syndicate, could be in other ways, but how do you see where people actually, not what people say, but what people actually do, and and then back that or follow that or somehow maybe with, with 10K or 100K or 100X more, but somehow follow what people do, experts or experienced people in the space, follow what they do and try to, to back them more. And I think it's still the most elegant answer I've heard. I don't know how to do it in practice. Don't, don't, don't get too excited, but how do we... Because I don't know either. I know where to ask. I know who to call for different questions. Um, but don't ask me how to farm or don't ask me how to, to do a lot of these things. But I think together, there is quite a wisdom in the informed crowd. And the informed crowd is, is partly listening to this podcast and partly we've interviewed them. And so somehow, if we would follow what they do, not what they say, I think it would be very interesting. Again, practicalities, I don't know how to do that, but I like it in, in, in theory. What a beautiful way to end the podcast. Definitely. It's been, it's been amazing. Kuhn, congrats again on 300 episodes. Um, thank you for all you do. It's been rewarding and educational for, for me personally and, and I'm sure for many of the audience. And I hope you, I hope you keep it going. I'm excited to, to see what's coming. Me too. Thank you for turning the tables this this time and unpacking and launching or no, not launching, announcing a significant milestone, not only the 300, but also publicly Generation Re, which has been a, a blast, apart from chasing signatures and things like that. But we <laughs> now got that covered with a platform and, and it's all, uh, it's very exciting. But one of the many things, I mean, it starts very small, just keep going and, and see if there's enough uh, interesting stories in the case of the podcast and interesting deals in case of the syndicate and see where it goes. I would have never mentioned, of course, 300 episodes and uh, whatever downloads we have, and that this would turn into a almost full-time, uh, full-time job. So let's see where, where it goes. Episode 500, 750, whatever. And would we do that in a metaverse or in, in audio only? <laughs> we have no clue. Indeed. Excited. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. For the show notes and links we discussed in this episode, check out our website, investinginregenerativeagriculture.com forward slash posts. If you liked this episode, why not share it with a friend or give us a rating on Apple Podcasts? That really helps. Thanks again and see you next time.